Hi everyone. So now let's look at the second really fundamental example of um, what we're eventually going to learn as a group. Uh, and this one's a little bit more complicated than the um, example of the integers mod n. Uh, so, and it's based on geometry. So uh, let's start by thinking a little bit about symmetry. So uh, a symmetry is, uh, when we think of something being symmetric, it, we mean that you can move it in a way so that after you make the motion, it comes back to where it started from. And to make that a little bit more formal, um, we need the idea of a rigid motion. So a rigid motion of the plane is a transformation of the, of the Euclidean plane that preserves the distances between points and the angles between lines. So distances between points, and it should say angles between lines. And there are three kinds of basic um, Euclidean rigid motions. There are rotations, where you take the plane and you turn it around a point. There are reflections, where you take the plane and you flip it across a line. And there are translations, where you take the plane and you move it from one place to another. Now, if you have a region in the plane, like let's say an equilateral triangle, a symmetry of that region is a rigid motion of the plane which carries the region back onto itself. So, for example, here are some pictures that try to capture some of these ideas. So here I've drawn a triangle which is supposed to be equilateral. Uh, a translation of that triangle would be a case where we move it Move, you could either think of moving the plane under it or moving the triangle on the plane without disturbing the lengths of the sides or the angles between the sides, and you move it from one place to another. Um, and it doesn't have to be horizontally. You could move it anywhere. A rotation of the triangle would be where we fix a point and we turn the triangle around that point. So here I've sort of rotated the triangle around this point here, uh, and I've rotated it like this. And finally, a reflection here. Uh, this is the artwork isn't so great here, but here's here's the uh, we draw a line in the plane and we take our region and we reflect it around that line. So it, it flips to its mirror image. So this triangle here is supposed to be the mirror image of that triangle there. Now, the particular case of a symmetry, for an example of a symmetry, so here's an equilateral triangle. If I make the 120 degree rotation of my triangle around its center, then the triangle transforms into itself. And so that's one of the symmetries of an equilateral triangle, 120 degree rotation around itself. And if you do that, then all the vertices come back to vertices and all the edges come back to edges. So formally speaking, a symmetry of a triangle or more generally of any region is a map or a function from that object to itself. It rearranges the edges and vertices, but it comes from a rigid motion. So all of the distances between the points stays the same and all of the angles between the sides stay the same. And one way to keep track of what's going on with a symmetry is to label the edges and vertices of the object. And even so even though the object transforms into itself, uh, you can see where the vertices went by, um, by keeping track. So let's look at some examples of that. So um, here's an example uh, of, of a rotation and we can look at what happens to the vertices. So here's my equilateral triangle, and I've labeled the vertices A, B, and C. So before I do the symmetry operation, I have the triangle A, B, C. Now I do a 120 degree clockwise rotation. So I've turned the triangle like that. I guess the, the camera mirrors this. Um, so I've turned the triangle this way. And when I do that, the vertex labeled B moves down to the vertex labeled C. The vertex labeled A moves up to the top. And the vertex labeled C moves over to where the vertex labeled A was. So I get the same triangle, but the vertex labels have moved. And that's how I know that I did something. Similarly, I could rotate in the opposite direction, backwards, counterclockwise. And if I do that, then the vertex A moves over here. The vertex C moves up here, 
and the vertex B moves down here. So by keeping track of the labeled vertices, I can see the effect of one of these symmetry operations. And of course, I can do the same thing with a reflection. Here I've got my triangle with the labeled vertices A, B, and C. To make a reflection, I need to pick a line, and I'm going to have to, it's going to have to be the case that when I do this reflection, it carries the shape back onto itself. So I've chosen for my reflection line the perpendicular bisector of the opposite side to the angle A here. And now when I do the reflection, these two vertices trade places. This vertex stays where it is, because if you're on the line where you're making the mirror reflection, nothing happens. And the triangle goes back into itself. So <clears throat> A stays in one place, and the vertices B and C trade places. So notice that all three of these are different. I mean, here I have the triangle counting from the left C, A, B. Here I have B, C, A. And here I have A, C, B. So um, I can use the labelings to keep track of what's going on. Now, what makes this uh, algebra, as opposed to geometry, is that you can multiply, in quotes, symmetries together and get other symmetries. And the operation is really composition of functions. So suppose I have two symmetries of an equilateral triangle, which means I have two functions from the equilateral triangle back to itself, possibly rearranging the edges and vertices. Then I can compose those two functions, meaning I can do first one and then the other, and the result is going to be yet another symmetry, because if I have one motion that takes the triangle and puts it back down on top of itself, and then another motion which takes the, picks up the triangle and puts it down back up on itself, the result of doing both of those things takes the triangle and puts it down back on itself. So it's another symmetry. So we're going to call that the product of these symmetries. And it's, but it's really the composition of functions. So when you write alpha, when I'm going to write alpha beta here for the product where alpha and beta are two symmetries, I mean the composition, alpha composed with beta. And maybe the single most confusing thing about all of this is to remember that when you write alpha beta for composition of functions, it means you first do beta and then you do alpha. That's not how we sometimes think about multiplication, but it's really important for composition of functions. You first do beta. If you have alpha composed with beta, you first do beta and then you do alpha. So again, uh, let's look at some examples. Let's start with the example of a, alpha as a clockwise rotation. So we know what alpha, al and the question is, what happens if you take alpha composed with alpha or alpha times alpha? Well, this means first do alpha and then do alpha again. So the first time we do alpha, it's a clock, it's a rotation like this. So A moves up to B, B moves down to C, and C moves over to A. And if I do this twice, it happens again. The vertex at the top, which is now C, sorry, which is now A, moves down to where B is. The vertex that we've labeled B moves over to where C is, and the vertex that we've labeled C moves over to where A is. So after doing alpha twice, we end up with the vertex B here, the vertex C here, and the vertex A here. And if you think about that, that's exactly the same if instead of doing a right rotation twice, we had done a left rotation once. A left rotation once would have taken C up to the top, B to the lower left, and A over to the right, which is just what we've got over here. So Doing the clockwise rotation twice is the same as doing the counterclockwise rotation once. And maybe that's not so surprising. If you do the clockwise rotation three times, you come back to where you started from. Let's look for another couple, uh, look at another example. So now alpha is the clockwise rotation, but sigma 
is going to be a reflection around the lower left-hand vertex. So what is alpha times sigma? Well, remember what this means. This means first do sigma, then do alpha. So we write down our triangle, A, B, C. We take the reflection line, that's the perpendicular bisector of the BC side, through A, and we do the sigma reflection, and the effect of that is to interchange B and C. Now we've done sigma, so we do alpha, and alpha is a, the rotation that's going to take C down to here. It's going to move C from the top to the lower right, move, move B around to where A is, and move A back up to the top. So the effect of doing first sigma and then alpha is to change the um, triangle and the edges in this way. And if you think about this for a minute, you see that the effect of the two-step process, C stayed fixed but B and A traded places. So the effect of doing alpha sigma is the same as doing the reflection uh, around the axis that goes through C. Suppose we did them in the other order. Well, now we do alpha first. Sigma alpha means alpha first. So we know what alpha does. It takes A, B, C. It brings A up to the top. It moves B down to the lower right, and it moves C down to the lower left, because this is the rotation like this. And now sigma fixes the vertex in the lower left and interchanges the two vertices opposite that. So it interchanges A and B, and we end up with CAB, or CBA, I guess. And if you look at this for a moment, you'll see that the, the com combine, the effect of doing the two of them together, was to leave B alone and flip C and A. So that's the effect, the same thing as doing the reflection where B is fixed and you reflect A and C across the axis that runs through B. The interesting thing about this is it's true in both cases that if you do two symmetries, you get another symmetry but the order matters. Alpha sigma and sigma alpha are different. In one case, alpha sigma left the point C alone, whereas sigma alpha left the point B alone. So this is a big difference between the kind of algebra that we're used to, for example, with the integers mod n, where if you add two congruence classes, the order doesn't matter. If we want to think about this as a kind of multiplication, then it's a kind of multiplication which is not commutative. The order of the two things matters a lot. Now, to, we can actually make a list of all of the symmetries of the triangle, and we can conclude that there are six of them. Now, how do we know that there are six symmetries? Well, the first thing we know is that any symmetry rearranges the three vertices A, B, and C. Because a symmetry has to take a vertex and it has to give you a new vertex. So if you think about the examples we looked at, if we labeled the vertices A, B, and C, after we do it, we still have three vertices, but they may be in different orders. And how many different ways can you rearrange the vertices? Well, there are only six six ways to rearrange A, B, and C. That's what's called the multiplication principle in 2710. If you want to make a rearrangement of A, B, and C, you have, you have to pick what you're going to, let's say, here's your triangle. You have to pick up A, B, or C to put here. That's three choices. Having picked A, B, or C to put there, then you have only two more choices, the other two to put here. And then you have only one choice, the one that's left here. And three times two times one is six. So there are at most six symmetries because you know that any symmetry is going to rearrange the vertices among themselves. It can't introduce new vertices. Then it wouldn't be a symmetry. 
On the other hand, it turns out that you can get any rearrangement you want. And that this is a, a copy of the chapter three, figure six from the book. And it lists all of the rearranged, all of the symmetries. And for each symmetry, it lists the rearrangement of the vertices. And the way to read this is the top row is where you started and the bottom row is where you ended up. So the identity sym symmetry just takes the triangle and leaves it alone. And it takes vertex A to vertex A, vertex B to vertex B, vertex C to vertex C. The clockwise rotation takes the vertex A to the vertex B, the vertex B to the vertex C, and the vertex C to the vertex A. And the author has called this rho sub one. R is a, that's the Greek letter rho. It makes an R sound. So that's why it's used for rotation. This is the rotation in the opposite direction, the counterclockwise rotation. It takes the vertex A to the vertex C, the vertex B to the vertex A, and the vertex C to the vertex B. So these are the two rotations in the two possible directions. And finally, there are three reflections. The three reflections, this is the reflection that fixes A and interchanges B and C. So you see it takes leaves A alone and it swaps B and C. This is the reflection that fixes B. So it leaves B alone. It sends A to C and C to A. And this is the reflection that fixes C. It leaves C alone and it swaps A and B and B and A. So we have here six symmetries namely a, an identity, two rotations, three reflections. And they cover every possible way of permu permuting the three vertices of the triangle. So if you had some other triangle, some other symmetry, maybe you think it's not on the list, and you looked at what it did to the vertices, it would have to do one of these six things. And so it would have to be, once you know where the vertices of the triangle go, since the, all the distances are preserved and all the angles are preserved, the triangle ends up back on top of itself. There's only six possibilities and every one of the six occur. So we have a kind of algebra of symmetries. We have six elements. And they can be combined by this composition operation, where if we do one followed by the other, we get a new one. But this is different from congruence classes mod six. That was another example of an algebraic object with six, thing, six elements in it, because we already know that the multiplication, which is given by composition here, is not commutative. It depends on the order. So chapter three, figure seven, is the multiplication table for these operations. And here's how you read it. You remember the order matters. So the one on the the thing on the left is the first thing, and the thing on the right is the second thing. So in other words, if we look here at row two, mu one, it says it's mu two. So what seems to be the rule here is that row two mu one equals mu two. So let's check and see if that's right. row two, mu one equals mu two. Now, row two, we know what that is. It's the rotation is the left rotation. And mu one is the flip around A. And we have to be very careful. This means first do the flip around A, which takes ABC to A. Oh, this should be B. That's how we start out always. It flips us to ACB. That's mu1. And then row two rotates us backwards to C. A, B, 
And if we compare this one and this one, the operation on the vertices here is that B stays the same and A and C trade places. If we go back and look at his naming scheme, B stays the same and A and C trade places is right here. That's mu2. So the equation rho2 mu1 equals mu2 checks out. I've done a couple more here, which we can just check for fun. Uh, row one, row two. Well, row one, root, row two means first do um, row two, which is the rotation to the left. So it takes A, C, B, B, A, C. This is the left rotation. And this is the right rotation. And not surprisingly, if you do a left rotation followed by a right rotation, they cancel out and you get no rotations at all. And if we look up here at row one, row two, we see that it's the identity, which is what we would have expected. The identity, remember, is the symmetry, which does nothing at all. Here's a few more calculations. Mu1, mu1. Well, so mu1, mu1 means mu1 is the reflection around the A. So if you do mu1, it reflects you around A, and it interchanges B and C. And if you do mu1 again, it leaves A alone, and it reflects B and C again, and puts everything back where it was. So mu1, mu1 should be the identity. But if you do mu1, mu2, that means first do mu2. So mu2, remember, is flipping around B. That interchanges A and C and leaves B alone. And then mu1 leaves the lower left-hand corner alone and flips A and B. And you end up with A, B, C. But that's which one is that? Well, if you compare, what happened is that uh, A went to C, because here's A and it became C, and B went to A, and C went to B. And if we flip back up here to his list, A went to B, B went to C, C went to A, that's row one. Oh, A went to C, B went to A. C went to B is row two, I guess. Row two, A went to C. So this is row two. And if we look up here at mu one, mu two, oops, we get row one. What did I do wrong? Oh, I'm just reading this wrong. Ah, let's do it one more time. This is why I always get confused. So A went to B. B went to C. C went to A. So this is a this is a left a right rotation. So we get that mu1 mu2 is row 1. All right, and let's try to do this one correctly. So now we're looking at um, row one, mu one. So row one, mu one means we first do mu one. So we fix A and we swap B and C. And then we do a rotation to the, uh, to the right. And that takes A up to the top, C down to here, and B over to there. And that's the reflection, which leaves C alone and swaps A and B. Uh, and that's the one which leaves C alone. That's mu3. So hopefully, if I've done this correctly, row 1 mu1 is mu3. So let's check that in the multiplication table. 
Yes, row 1, mu 1 is mu 3. And finally, if I do row 1 first, here, then I take A up to B, B down to C, C over to uh, A, like this, and then I do mu 1, so I leave C alone. And this is the, uh, the flip which leaves B in place. So this should be mu 2. So mu 1, row 1, should be mu 2. Yeah, mu1, row1 is mu2. <laughs> so that's how you do these calculations. Um, and we'll have lots more opportunity to play around with this kind of thing. Uh, for your own mental health, I would recommend picking a few more terms out of this multiplication table. There's 36 entries, and make sure that you, uh, you agree with what's going on. In conclusion, I just want to point out a few things. If you just look at this part right here, these are the rotations. You see that um, if you do rotation 1 followed by rotation 1, you get rotation 2. And if you do rotation 1 followed by rotation 2, you get the identity element again. That's because you're, if you're only thinking about rotations, you can do a rotation of 1, 2 times that rotation, and 3 times that rotation takes you back. If you think about it a little bit, that's exactly the same as if you were to do arithmetic modulo 3. Do it once, do it twice, and then three times takes you back to the origin. And the other part is to notice that if you take the reflections on the diagonal here, you always have the identity. That's because all these reflections have the property that they, when you do them twice, if you reflect and then reflect back, you get where you started from. And so they act they, together with the identity, act like the integers mod 2. But what makes this uh, not just a copy of the integers mod 6 is the non-commutativity, the fact that the order in which you do the operations matters.